Now we determine some of the thermodynamic variables and potentials as the derivatives of the potentials at given conditions during a process in a thermodynamic system. We have seen that each fundamental equation describes the differential of a given thermodynamic potential as a function of other potentials and state variables. We call the quantities appearing in the differentials in the right-hand sides of these four equations the natural variables of the potential in the left-hand sides. If we express the potentials as functions of their natural variables, then their exact differentials can also be written as the sum of the partial derivatives of the potentials with respect to the natural variables times the differentials of the natural variables. The first fundamental equation shows that the natural variables of the internal energy U are the entropy S, the volume V and the number of particles Ni. Then the differential of the internal energy U is equal to the partial derivative of U with respect to S at constant V and Ni, times the differential of S, plus the partial derivative of U with respect to V at constant S and Ni, times the differential of V, plus the sum of the partial derivative of U with respect to Ni at constant S, V, and Nj, where J is not equal to I, times the differential of Ni. Here the index I runs through all the species in the system. By considering the second fundamental equation, we see that the natural variables of the enthalpy H are the entropy S, the pressure P and the number of particles Ni. As a result, the differential of the enthalpy H can be written as the partial derivative of H with respect to S at constant P and Ni, times the differential of S, plus the partial derivative of H with respect to P at constant S and Ni, times the differential of P, plus the sum of the partial derivative of H with respect to Ni at constant S, P and Nj where J is not equal to I, times the differential of Ni. The third fundamental equation shows that the natural variables of the free energy F are the temperature T, the volume V and the number of particles Ni. Then the differential of the free energy F is equal to the partial derivative of F with respect to T at constant V and Ni, times the differential of T, plus the partial derivative of F with respect to V at constant T and Ni, times the differential of V, plus the sum of the partial derivative of F with respect to Ni at constant T, V and Nj where J is not equal to I, times the differential of Ni. Finally, it follows from the fourth fundamental equation that the natural variables of the free enthalpy G are the temperature T, the pressure P and the number of particles Ni. The differential of the free enthalpy G is therefore given by the partial derivative of G with respect to T at constant P and Ni, times the differential of T, plus the partial derivative of G with respect to P at constant T and Ni, times the differential of P, plus the sum of the partial derivative of G with respect to Ni at constant T, P and Nj where J is not equal to I times the differential of Ni. By comparing the equations in the left and the right-hand side in each line we find the following. The comparison of the equations in the first line gives three expressions, where the first one states that the temperature T is equal to the partial derivative of the internal energy U with respect to the entropy S at the constant volume V and the number of particles Ni. The second one tells us that the pressure P is given by minus the partial derivative of the internal energy U with respect to the volume V at the constant entropy S and the number of particles Ni. The third one states that the chemical potential mu I is equal to the partial derivative of the internal energy U with respect to the number of particles Ni at the constant entropy S, the volume V and the number of particles Nj, where J is not equal to I. If we compare the equations in the second line then we obtain another three expressions. In the first one, the temperature T is equal to the partial derivative of the enthalpy H with respect to the entropy S at the constant pressure P and the number of particles Ni. In the second one, the volume V is given by the partial derivative of the enthalpy H with respect to the pressure P at the constant entropy S and the number of particles Ni. In the third one, the chemical potential mu I is equal to the partial derivative of the enthalpy H with respect to the number of particles Ni at the constant entropy S, the pressure P and the number of particles Nj, where J is not equal to I. We can derive further free expression by comparing the equations in the third line with each other. The first expression states that the entropy S is equal to minus the partial derivative of the free energy F with respect to the temperature T at the constant volume V and the number of particles Ni. The second one tells us that the pressure P is given by minus the partial derivative of the free energy F with respect to the volume V at the constant temperature T and the number of particles Ni. The third one states that the chemical potential mu I is equal to the partial derivative of the free energy F with respect to the number of particles Ni at the constant temperature T, the volume V and the number of particles Nj, where J is not equal to I. The last group of expressions comes from the comparison of the two equations in the fourth line with each other. In the first expression, that the entropy S is equal to minus the partial derivative of the free enthalpy G with respect to the temperature T at the constant pressure P and the number of particles Ni. In the second one, 
the volume V is given by the partial derivative of the free enthalpy G with respect to the pressure P at the constant temperature T and the number of particles Ni. In the third one, the chemical potential mu I is equal to the partial derivative of the free enthalpy G with respect to the number of particles Ni at the constant temperature T, the pressure P and the number of particles Nj, where J is not equal to I. We will use these four groups of equations to express each thermodynamic potential as an explicit function of the rest of the potentials and state variables. In order to provide such expressions, we will apply Euler's theorem for homogeneous functions, but first let us examine how the potentials scale with state variables. We saw that any thermodynamic potential phi i is a state function depending on the pressure p, the volume v, the temperature t of a system, and the number of particles nj in the system in the absence of external forces. When we introduced the thermodynamic quantities describing the properties of an ideal gas we classified them as extensive and intensive properties. We found that the volume V or the mass M, that is the number of the particles Nj of the gas are extensive properties depending on the amount of matter present in the system. Since we interpret both the internal energy and the heat as quantities determined by the molecular motion in the kinetic theory of gases or any other substance, it can be shown that both internal energy and entropy depend on the amount of matter in the system. Then they are also extensive properties of a thermodynamic system. It is also true for the rest of the thermodynamic potentials defined by expressions in which the extensive quantities appear in sums or in products with intensive quantities. As a result, all the thermodynamic potentials phi i are extensive properties of a system. Among the state variables, only the pressure p and the temperature t are intensive properties independent from the amount of matter in the system. In order to specify the amount of matter in a thermodynamic system, we use the number of particles present there. If we scale the number of particles nj with a factor lambda, then the volume V occupied by the particles also scales with the same factor. The thermodynamic potentials of a given system have the same scaling property, that is the potentials are multiplied by lambda in a system with the number of particles lambda times nj. Therefore, a potential phi i as a function of either on the volume V or on the number of particles nj or on both of them can be evaluated at lambda times V and lambda times nj giving lambda times phi i evaluated at v and nj. In mathematics, a function with such a property is called homogeneous function in the variables exhibiting this scaling property. We call a function f of n variables a homogeneous function of degree k in its first variables x1, x2, ellipsis, xm with m less than or equal to n, if the function f evaluated at lambda times x1, ellipsis, lambda times xm, xm plus 1, ellipsis, xn, is equal to lambda to k times the function f evaluated at x1, ellipsis, xm, xm plus 1, ellipsis, xn. Here lambda is an arbitrary real parameter. Now we compute the derivative of this equation with respect to the parameter lambda. By introducing the notation y for lambda times xi, we can write the derivative of the left-hand side as the derivative of the function f evaluated at y1, ellipsis, ym, xm plus 1, ellipsis, xn with respect to lambda, and apply the chain rule for the function yi. Then we obtain the sum of the partial derivative of the function f with respect to yi at constant yj where j is not equal to i, times the partial derivative of yi with respect to lambda, from i equals to 1 to m. If we substitute the definition of yi into the derivatives, then we take the partial derivatives of the function f with respect to lambda times xi, and the derivative of yi with respect to lambda can be written as xi. Now we compute the derivative of the left-hand side of the definition of the homogeneous function f. The derivative of lambda to k times the function f with respect to lambda, is equal to k times lambda to k minus 1, times the function f. By inserting these two equations into the derivative of the definition of the homogeneous function f and setting the arbitrary parameter lambda to 1, we obtain Euler's theorem for homogeneous functions, which states the following. If a function f of n variables is a homogeneous function of degree k in its first m variables, then k times the function f is equal to the sum of the derivative of the function f with respect to xi, times xi from i equals to 1 to m. As the scaling property of the thermodynamic potential shows, they are homogeneous functions of degree 1, and Euler's theorem for k equals to 1 can be applied for them. Now we apply Euler's theorem for the thermodynamic potentials to write them in a set of equations known as Euler integrals. In this table the first column contains four thermodynamic potentials as functions of their natural variables. Since the natural variables of the internal energy U are the entropy S, the volume V and the number of particles Ni, the internal energy of a thermodynamic system is a homogeneous function of degree 1 in all its natural variables. 
by applying Euler's theorem for the internal energy, we can write U as the partial derivative of U with respect to S at constant V and Ni, times S, plus the partial derivative of U with respect to V at constant S and Ni, times V, plus the sum of the partial derivative of U with respect to Ni at constant S, V and Nj, where J is not equal to I, times Ni and the index I runs from 1 to the number of the species N. We already determined the partial derivatives in this expression, and we saw that the first one is equal to the temperature T, the second one is equal to minus the pressure P, and the third one is equal to the chemical potential mu I. As a result, the internal energy U is equal to the temperature T times the entropy S, minus the pressure P times the volume V, plus the sum of the chemical potential mu I times the number of particles N I from I equals to 1 to N. The natural variables of the enthalpy H are the entropy S, the number of particles N I, and the pressure P but only the first two of them are extensive properties. Therefore, Enthalpy is a homogeneous function of degree 1 and its first two variables, and it follows from Euler's theorem that the enthalpy H is equal to the partial derivative of H with respect to S at constant P and Ni, times S, plus the sum of the partial derivative of H with respect to Ni at constant S, P and Nj where J is not equal to I, times Ni from I equals to 1 to N. The partial derivatives in this expression were also determined, and we found that the first one is equal to the temperature T and the second one is equal to the chemical potential mu I. As a result, the enthalpy H is given by the temperature T times the entropy S, plus the sum of the chemical potential mu I times the number of particles Ni from I equals to 1 to N. The natural variables of the free energy F are the volume V, the number of particles Ni and the temperature T. Then the free energy is a homogeneous function of degree 1 in its first two variables allowing us to apply Euler's theorem for it, and write the free energy F as the partial derivative of F with respect to V at constant T and Ni, times V, plus the sum of the partial derivative of F with respect to Ni at constant T, V and Nj where J is not equal to I, times Ni from I equals to 1 to N. We also know the partial derivatives in this expression. The first one is equal to minus the pressure P and the second one is equal to the chemical potential mu I. Then the free energy F is given by minus the pressure P times the volume V, plus the sum of the chemical potential mu I times the number of particles N I from I equals to 1 to N. Since the natural variables of the free enthalpy G are the number of particles N I, the temperature T and the pressure P, free enthalpy is a homogeneous function of degree 1 in its first variable. By applying Euler's theorem, the free energy G can be written as the sum of the partial derivative of G with respect to N I at constant T. P and Nj where J is not equal to I, times Ni from I equals to 1 to N. Here the partial derivative is equal to the chemical potential mu I, and the free enthalpy G is simply equal to the sum of the chemical potential mu I times the number or particles Ni from I equals to 1 to N. The expression obtained for the internal energy U is also known as Euler equation in thermodynamics, and the four equations in the last column are called Euler integrals because they are derived by applying Euler's theorem. Although the last three equations are the consequences of the application of Euler's theorem, they immediately follow from the Euler equation. Since the enthalpy H is defined by the sum of the internal energy U and the product of the pressure P and the volume V, we can substitute into the definition the Euler equation, and write H as T times S minus P times V plus the sum of mu I times N I, plus P times V, then we obtain the equation in the third line of the table. Similarly, the free energy F is defined by the internal energy U minus the temperature T times the entropy S. By substituting the Euler equation into the definition, we have T times S plus P times V plus the sum of mu I times N I, minus T times S, which gives the equation in the fourth line of the table. Finally, the free enthalpy G defined by the enthalpy H minus the temperature T times the entropy S can also be seen as the consequence of the Euler equation because the substitution of the expression obtained for the enthalpy into its definitions gives T times S minus the sum of mu I times N I, minus T times S, which can be reduced to the equation in the fifth line of the table. Now we can compare the fundamental equations in thermodynamics with the Euler integrals. Here we can see the five fundamental equations where the first two equations are equivalent to each other. We already saw that in these equations the differentials of the thermodynamic potentials are expressed as functions of the differentials of their natural variables. We also show the Euler integral supplemented with the Euler equation solved for the entropy S, as seen in the second equation. These expressions present the thermodynamic potentials as functions of their natural variables, and we can write them in the following general form. If we denote the extensive properties among the natural variables such as the entropy S, the volume V and the number of particles Ni by calligraphic E, 
and denote the intensive properties appearing the Euler integral such as the temperature T, the pressure P, and the chemical potential mu I by calligraphic I, then any potential phi in the four independent Euler integrals can be written as the sum of Cij, times calligraphic Ij, times calligraphic Ej from J to 1 to the number of the terms in the right-hand sides of the Euler integrals. Here the multiplication factor Cij is defined by plus 1, minus 1, or 0 depending on the JTH term in the ith Euler integral. Since the comparison of the first fundamental equation with the Euler equation shows the resemblance in their structures, we could assume the fundamental equations can be derived from the differentials of the Euler integrals. If we compute the differential of the potential phi i, then we can write d phi i as the sum of Cij times calligraphic Ej times the differential of calligraphic Ij, plus the sum of Cij times calligraphic Ij times the differential of calligraphic Ej. We can see that the right-hand side of this equation has terms with both the differentials of the intensive properties and the differentials of the extensive ones. This is not the case for the first fundamental equation containing only the differentials of the extensive properties. That is, the fundamental equation cannot be derived alone from the differential of the Euler equation. In fact, the fundamental equations and the Euler integrals are two sets of equations independent from each other. As a result, they can be combined to derive new expressions describing the relations between the potentials and the state variables of a thermodynamic system. Such an expression is the gibbs duhem equation, and we can derive it from the Euler equation and the first fundamental equation. The Euler equation states that the internal energy U of a thermodynamic system is given by the product of its temperature T and entropy S, minus the product of its pressure P and volume V, plus the sum of the chemical potential mu times the number of particles ni from i equals to 1 to the number n of the species in the system. By computing the differential of the internal energy, we can write that du is equal to s times dt plus t times ds, minus v times dp minus p times dv, plus the sum of the quantity of ni times d mu i plus mu i times dni. If we reorder the terms in the right-hand side then we have t times ds minus p times dv plus the sum of mu i times dni plus s times dt minus v times dp plus the sum of ni times d mu i. The first fundamental equation states that the differential of the internal energy u is equal to t times ds, minus p times dv, plus the sum of mu i times dni. By substituting it into the differential of the Euler equation, we obtain the gibbs duhem equation stating that the sum of the number of particles ni times the differential of the chemical potential mu i from i equals to 1 to the number n of the species in the system, is equal to minus the entropy s of the system, times the differential of its temperature t, plus the volume v of the system times the differential of its pressure p. We note that we can also obtain the gibbs duhem equation, if we compute the differential of the Euler integral stating that the free enthalpy G is equal to the sum of the chemical potential Mi times the number of particles Ni from I equal to 1 to N. Then DG is equal to the sum of the quantity of Ni times D mu I plus mu I times DNI. At the same time, the last fundamental equation obtained for the free enthalpy G states that its differential is equal to minus S times DT, plus V times DP, plus the sum of mu I times DNI. If we substitute it into the differential of the Euler integral then we obtain the gibbs duhem equation. Since the differentials in the chemical potential, the temperature and the pressure appear in the gibbs duhem equation, the equation represents a constraint on the change in the chemical potential of a thermodynamic system in terms of the change in its temperature and pressure for a given composition of the system. In the case of isothermal and isobaric processes the right-hand side of the equation vanishes, and we can write that the sum of the number of particles ni times the differential of the chemical potential mu i from i equals to 1 to number n of the species in the system vanishes. For two component systems we have only two terms in the sum, and we can express the infinitesimal change in the chemical potential mu 1 as minus the ratio of the number of particles n1 to the number of particles n2, times the infinitesimal change in the chemical potential mu 2.